Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 21. In this part, I'm going to talk about the gravitational parameter. In Kepler's orbital dynamics, he was looking at systems with a very large central body, like our solar system. In a system like that, the central body dominates. Here's Newton's gravitational equation, and here's the equation that comes out of Newton's second law. If you equate these two forces, the small masses cancel out and you end up with an equation for acceleration that's caused by the central body with mass, capital M. For a system like our solar system, there's a convention that's used where a gravitational parameter mu is defined to be the product of the gravitational constant G and the dominant mass, capital M. In the case of our solar system, the dominant mass is the sun's mass. Mu is in units of meters cubed over seconds squared. Newton's gravitational equation would be F equals mu times m over r squared, and the acceleration equation would be mu over r squared. And here are gravitational parameters for the planets. I got these from Wikipedia, um, and they vary quite a bit. In part 18, I talked about uniform circular motion. I'm going to review some of what I taught you. Here's the position vector r. And here's the angle theta, which we call the true anomaly. Theta varies over time by a factor omega. Omega is the angular speed. And the x and y components of r are r cosine theta times the unit vector i and r sine theta times the unit vector j. And since both of those x and y components are vectors, when I add them, I get the position, position vector r. I can substitute omega t for theta. Uh, velocity is the derivative of position, hence velocity is tangent to the position function. In part 18, I showed you how to take the derivative of the position vector r. V equals minus r omega sine omega t times i plus r omega cosine omega t times j. The scalar v equals the square root of the sum of the squares of the scalar x and y components. And I showed you in part 18 that that reduces to r omega. The derivative of velocity is acceleration, that's this vector here. And here's the derivative I showed you in part 18. And if you take the square root of the sum of the squares of the x and y components, it reduces to a equals omega squared r, which equals v squared over r. And I showed you that acceleration equals gm over r squared or mu over r squared. If v squared over r equals gm over r squared, then um, v squared equals gm over r, which equals mu over r. Hence, v equals the square root of gm over r, or the square root of mu over r. For uniform circular motion, omega, the angular speed, equals 1 full 2 pi radian rotation over the period of the orbit, capital T. In the equation A equals omega squared R, I can substitute 2 pi over T for omega. I get 2 pi over T squared times R. That equals R pi squared over, that, I'm sorry, that equals 4 pi squared R over T squared. Hence, mu over R squared equals 4 pi squared R over T squared. Mu this equals r equals 4 pi squared times r cubed over t squared. t squared then equals 4 pi squared r cubed over mu. And that implies that t squared is proportional to r cubed, which is Kepler's third law. Omega for uniform circular motion is the change in angle over the change in time. Since this is uniform circular motion, the change in angle over time, d theta dt, is constant for the entire orbit. Hence, the d theta t dt equals an entire revolution through 2 pi radians over the period of the orbit, capital T. If t squared equals 4 pi squared r cubed over mu, then 1 over t equals the square root of mu over 4 pi squared r cubed, and that reduces to the square root of mu over 2 pi 
times the square root of r cubed. I can substitute that for capital T above. I have 2 pi in both the numerator and denominator. Those cancel. And that reduces to the square root of mu over the, the square root of r cubed. For an ellipse, you'd substitute the semi-major axis for r in this equation and in others. This isn't a rigorous proof, but in general, Kepler's third law states that the period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. And I'll do four more formal derivations in a later part. The main takeaway here is that if you know the mass of the central body, mu equals the gravitational constant times capital M. If, however, you know the semi-major axis in the period, then mu equals 4 pi squared times the semi-major axis cubed over the period squared. With this equation, I can derive mean velocities. This assumes a circular orbit, so these are mean velocities. Later, I'll show you an equation that will give you the velocity anywhere along an elliptical orbit. This is the gravitational parameter for the sun. I'm showing you the constant g times the mass of the sun. And from that, I can determine the mean orbital velocity of the Earth. That is mu divided by the Earth's semi-major axis, which is 1.32673 times 10 to the 20th, divided by 1.49598 times 10 to the 11th. I take the square root of that, and I get 29,780 meters per second. The gravitational parameter for the Earth is the gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth. From that, I can compute the mean velocity of the moon. It's uh, the square root of mu, mu for the Earth divided by the moon's uh, orbit semi-major axis. And the mean orbital velocity of the moon is 1,019 meters per second. If we were to launch a satellite at one kilometer above the surface of the Earth, or 1,000 meters, the semi-major axis would be I'm sorry, if we were to launch the satellite at 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, or a million meters, the semi-major axis would be 6,371,000 meters plus 1 million meters. And the mean orbital velocity would be 7.351 times 10 to the third meters per second, or 7.3 kilometers per second. A satellite at that altitude travels more than seven times faster than the moon. This is a short section. Um, the main takeaway is the gravitational parameter, mu, and the two ways to determine it. Personally, I prefer to use the gravitational constant and masses of bodies. Um, mu doesn't offer much convenience. And in a later section, I'm going to talk about the unbody problem, where a series of masses interact with each other gravitationally, and there is no central mass. For that, you really don't need and you don't want a gravitational constant.